It is my pleasure to introduce today's presenter, Kevin Schwears. Kevin has been an IT instructor for over 15 years. He has over 35 years of a computer network experience, and he is currently holds the CCNA routing and switching in the CCNA data center credentials. Kevin, it's all yours. Let's begin. Hey, good morning. Welcome, everybody. I say good morning from the East Coast. Uh, it's a uh, surprise to me to have students log in from so far away, but welcome. This morning's seminar, we're going to focus on segmentation on an Ethernet LAN. We're going to use the OSI model. I know uh, I've heard and I've read where the OSI is dead, kill the beast. Um, you'll see, you'll notice in a lot of Cisco's curriculum where they're trying to rev kind of migrate away from the OSI but reveal more of the TCP IP model. But to my amazement, when I went to Cisco Live, in Florida a couple of years ago, I went up to every single vendor, 100%, and I asked them to describe their product, and 100% referenced the OSI. So um, I think it's a wonderful tool, and I'm going to use it in this presentation. Two significant terms that I enforce or reveal in my course is the collision domain, also known as a contention domain, um, it's very, very important to talk the correct language in this industry. It has to do with media access. When am I able to speak? And Ethernet itself, when in its inception, is chaotic. Um, Ethernet, the device has to listen, and if the line is clear, then it can transmit. And unfortunately, there could be multiple devices listening at the same time, and they attempt to transmit at the same time, and we end up with collisions. So contention results in collisions. So we use the words interchangeably when we reference uh, segmentation. Um, because of this, there's two primary protocols to consider. Carrier sense, multi-access with collision detection. Carrier sense multi-access simply is the understanding that there's more than one device that can transmit at the same time and we will be courteous and listen to see if somebody else is transmitting. Collision detection is after the fact. If there are collisions, we will agree to hush up for a random amount of time and reattempt uh, to uh, transmit. Let me see, I see some chats going on there. Are they from my, okay. Okay, are y'all able to hear okay, Jim? You sound great, Kevin. Okay, very good, thank you. Okay, I saw my chat window was flashing. I wasn't sure if that was about me. Okay, thank you. Okay, so, oh, and going back, I hit the button too quick. Come on, you rascal. There we go. Uh, broadcast domain is how far will my broadcast travel? Um, we tried to limit the scopes of our collision domain to uh, increase media access but we also try to limit the scope of the broadcast domain, as we will see, because Ethernet has several broadcast related services like DHCP, Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol, and Address Resolution Protocol. They're constantly uh, used, very known in our networks today, so we kind of limit their scopes with broadcast domains. All right, so to begin with an Ethernet frame, you start with a preamble, which provides synchronization and timing. It is eight bytes. And uh, there's, there's argument on seven bytes or eight bytes. We're just gonna go with eight bytes for simplicity. Then directly uh, behind the preamble is destination MAC address. And this is unique at layer two that the destination is the first. It is the first six bytes followed by the second six bytes, which would be the source address. And then there's uh, the type slash length field uh, depending on the original flavor of Ethernet to where we are today. And the data field, 46 to 1500, with a frame check sequence of four bytes. Now, if you'll notice the math, I did not include the preamble, but if you add six plus six plus two plus 46, the smallest data field, plus four, you have 64 bytes, which is the smallest accepted Ethernet frame, unless told otherwise. And anything less would be considered a runt, which comes from poor segmentation or collisions. We have, um, if you add the other extreme in the data field, 1500, so six plus six plus two plus 1500 plus four, 
you have 1518, which is the largest accepted ethernet frame. Anything greater would be considered a giant. And those of you that are familiar with Cisco tests, if it's between 1518 and 1600, we call it a baby giant compared to a jumbo giant. Again, some real world isms compared to Cisco test isms. All right, so let's hone in on the OSI model, the physical layer. The physical layer offers no segmentation. It is, I don't care how many physical interfaces, you have one common collision domain, one common broadcast domain. Uh, you test takers know that it's called a flat network. Um, it's here that we find hubs, also known as repeaters, to get us beyond the limitations of Ethernet being 328 feet. The, a hub will receive a frame and it will repeat that frame out all ports, including the port in which it arrived. So it does not offer intelligence at layer one. So now stepping up to OSI layer two, known as the data link layer. Um, if you have a layer two device that has 12 ports, you now have 12 unique collision domains. So you test takers know that a switch creates multiple smaller collision domains, but we still maintain a single common broadcast domain. Layer two devices make forwarding decisions on hardware addresses, um, which if you have history to you, you'll know uh, dip switches, jumpers, etc., or even what we have today, the MAC address, media access address is an example of a hardware address. Also at layer two, we have something known as VLANs. What they do is they create smaller, multiple smaller broadcast domains at layer two. That's very, very important at layer two. Without VLANs, the only way we controlled broadcast domains was with layer three. If you have history to you going back to the early 90s, layer three was very costly. It, it was not very popular. It was, there was very few. Um, in the early 90s, we were flat from East Coast to West Coast, very little being done. Um, it, it wasn't until computers got faster, uh, more users involved, we start bringing voice video into it that we said, wait, we can't, we've got to do something. We've got to segment. And, um, and also layer three became as quick as layer two. So it offers segmentation, security, and network flexibility with VLANs because it's the logical division of a physical resource. Each VLAN behaves like a separate physical bridge. And the fact that at layer two, there's only two things that can occur a layer two device can only flood or filter, layer two flood or filter. And so when we create VLANs, that flood or filter stays within the context of that VLAN. Uh, we're still falling back to our proper design. Each unique VLAN should, be a, should map to a unique broadcast domain and our unique broadcast domain should map to a unique network. So going back to the ethernet frame, we're gonna track that frame at it as it arrives inside a layer two device. So when the layer two device receives the frame, it will inspect the destination Mac and ask, is it for me personally? Um, there's a lot of inner switch link communication, uh, things like CDP, STP, VDP, DDP, et cetera. Um, also, if I own it at layer two, it's possible I own it at layer three and it might be telnet, ping, traceroute, et cetera. The management VLAN is a VLAN in which the switch actually is accessible as a host. In fact, on a test question, if you see switch and followed by a pound sign, and the test states that telnet and ping and traceroute are not working, then that means this switch does not have its own host identity. So you could be a mail person and you deliver mail all day long, but it would be nice for you to go home and have your very own mailbox. And like anybody else, you respond and you have to lick and stamp and address envelopes and deposit them correctly. 
So when you're using telnet ping trace route, for instance, you're relying on the ARP cache. You're not relying on the MAC address table. So there's a difference when a layer two device is a switch or when I'm addressing it, communicating to it as a host. So if it's not for the switch personally as a host, then it will learn the source MAC address by placing it in the MAC address table for 300 seconds, also known as five minutes. It will then look up the destination for an exact match, else flood, else flood. Now, ex exact match means all 48 bits or all six bytes or all 12 hexadecimal characters have to match, else flood. Do not say broadcast. Broadcast is a destination address where you have 12 hexadecimal Fs in the destination field. Flood is a behavior of the layer two device as it responds. It will either say, I have knowledge, therefore I will filter, or I do not have knowledge, therefore I flood. In flood, we forward the frame out all ports except the port in which it arrived. Remember at layer one, it just simply repeated it out all ports, including the port in which it arrived. Whereas layer two has enough intelligence to say, because ethernet is multi-axis, anybody out there who, who owns it would have already benefited from it. There's three reasons to result in a flood, and that's whenever there's a broadcast in the destination field, a multicast or an unknown unicast. Originally, we had a bridge for a layer two device and we would connect with coax. So there would be multiple hosts per coax segment. So therefore in the MAC address table, there would be multiple source MACs mapped to a physical interface. But the bridge behaved the same way in that it would learn the source, seek the destination, exact match else flood. So let's take a little forward with, uh, I made up some addresses here. As they arrive in a switch, port one, you will see that it learns the source MAC address, which is in blue. It now will seek the destination in red. And when it does, it's going to look at all ports of the same VLAN in which it received. So it's only going to consider the VLANs, the ports that are participating in VLAN 10. Remember a VLAN behaves like a separate physical bridge or separate physical switch. So in this story, the destination is not found, so it will flood. It's going to forward the frame out all ports except for the port in which it arrived. So that's port three, five, and seven. And let's take my story a little further to say that on port seven is where the destination resides. So now the destination needs to respond back. So we're gonna flip the source and destination. Again, we're going to learn the source, seek the destination. We do have knowledge of the destination, so it results in a flood. I'm sorry, a filter. Um, switch, a switch can make a decision based on different elements of the frame. If it looks at the first six bytes of the destination MAC, that's called cut through or real time. Um, that is the Cisco default. The problem is we propagate collisions. So we can adjust the switch to look at fragment free, which would look at the first 64 bytes. It's also called modified cut through or run free. And, or we could really look at the entire store and forward the entire frame. Now we're stepping up to layer three. These devices are called routers or layer three switches. Each physical interface not only is a unique collision domain, but a unique broadcast domain. And we want to reinforce that each unique broadcast domain should map to a unique network. Okay. 
All right, so as the router receives a frame, like any other node on the network, it's going to inspect the destination MAC. If the destination MAC is owned by the router, then the router will receive it and remove layer two. It's going to strip away layer two, the header, and look at layer three and say, do I own the destination IP? For It might be routing protocols, telnet, ping, trace route. Now, if it's owned at layer two, but not layer three, well, then it must challenge the routing table. And it's going to challenge the routing table for longest match, longest match else discard or drop. So a switch, a brand new switch can be plugged in and it will work. It will automatically start learning and flooding and filtering. But a router on the other hand, a true router by the definition is a brick unless it is given some information. Longest match means, let's challenge the routing table from left to right, 32 bits. If not, I, if I don't have a match, then 31 bits. If I don't have a match, then 30. And if I don't have a match and so on. If not, I will discard. Longest match else discard. What we like to do is place a default route in there to circumvent the discard. It's, it's kind of like a Hail Mary. It's a way of saying, I really don't know, but ask this neighbor, go this way. Okay, so I hope that was well for you. And now we're ready for questions. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, that was great. Uh, yeah, please everyone post your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, Kevin uh, will spend some time answering those. Uh, looks like we have one at the moment. Um, Kevin, let's see if we can tackle this. Um, how important is it? How important is CCN, CCNA certification for a network professional? Well, that's a that's a good argument because I've known some brilliant, some very very brilliant students who could not get to the CCNA test. Um, it's my perception. Let me make sure I clarify that you're listening to Kevin, not Global Knowledge or Cisco. If if you're known. If you're known by the person doing the hiring, I would say that it's slightly important. But if you're unknown and you're trying to throw a resume out there, uh, I, I would say it's a, it's a significant uh, catch because, you know, they, they do searches on keywords. Uh, also, by having so many certified individuals with your organization, it qualifies for some um, superior vendor relations and uh, with Cisco. So in that regard, if, if it's your goal to go into networking, I would say it will serve you well. Hey, great. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, let me see. I'm trying to uh, uh, digest this question. Uh, it's specific to port and MAC addresses. Can you uh, describe those with relation okay. to uh, Cisco uh, networking? Yeah, uh, <laughs> yes. That's, uh, it's interesting how the, the words get used multiple times, multiple ways. Okay, so we're not talking about a physical interface here. We're talking about a way to identify a protocol. So a protocol is a individual rule. So let's say we're gonna play baseball and your position is to throw the ball very fast, very accurate at somebody else. And that's a single rule and by yourself, if you're out in the baseball field, you're not gonna enjoy the results. You're gonna throw the ball and have to go retrieve the ball yourself. So for that reason, we put a group of protocols together uh, on a common purpose and we call that a protocol suite. Protocol stack is basically who hands off to who. So you throw the ball to the catcher, the guy swings, hits the ball, run, run, run to first base, then second. That, that kind of sequence of events is identified as a port. Who do you hand off to? Uh, you'll hear port most commonly addressed at layer four, like port 80 uh, being the well-known port for HTTP, 23 for Telnet, et cetera. But every layer of the OSI model, well, yeah, I think I'll, I'll just go with that. Um, layer two and up has a protocol field to identify who it hands up to next. And loosely that's referred to as ports. Is that acceptable? Oh, and MAC address is actually a example of a hardware address at layer two. Uh, Ethernet's rules are your MAC address has to be unique per broadcast domain, 
So that means or implies, and I've witnessed firsthand, I can have the same MAC address as long as it's not the same broadcast domain. Great, thank you, Kevin. Uh, let's see, next question. Which layer helps to transfer data between mobile network devices? Well, <laughs> that's, a, that's a good question in itself. Um, I, let's go with OSI layer one, two, and three. Um, if all I wanna do is ping you, but if I'm trying to share something with you, then let's use all seven layers. You, you have a frame, 802.11, that is received by the wireless device. And at some point, that frame needs to be translated to 802.3. And then a device will make a decision on that 802.3 to flood or filter. And eventually, this, the destination MAC may be another node, or it might be the router, which would make the decision at layer three and so on. Okay, thank you, Kevin. Yeah, no, I think that covers it. Uh, let's see, can you uh, provide a brief explanation of the OSPF and RIP protocols? OSPF and RIP, okay, so routers are like a brick. They have to have information else they discard. So uh, we, when we actually configure a router for the very first time, we put an IP address and mask on the physical interface and we populate the route table. So it is well said or understood that routers know directly connected networks. Now, anything that's not directly connected is considered remote and the administrator can choose to statically uh, put that information on the router or enable a dynamic routing protocol such as RIP, OSPF, EIGRP, et cetera. There are some routing protocols that are designed to work interior to, to your organization. We call those interior gateway protocols. Uh, think of it like a map at a street level and RIP and OSPF are examples of interior gateway protocols, but they, they differ in how they calculate the best. RIP is pretty stupid. It just counts the number of routers between the source and destination. It doesn't acknowledge bandwidth. Um, so it's not intelligent and it doesn't scale well and it's very old back when networks were small, it was just fine. OSPF is a much more robust, scalable, intelligent routing protocol that can appreciate um, your various bandwidth on your segment. Great, Kevin. We're getting a lot of really good questions now. Uh, could you please explain what will be the destination MAC in the pack of it is not known for destination MAC? Does that make sense? Well, if I don't know the destination, and at layer two, then it's going to be 12 hexadecimal Fs. Um, well, no. No, wait a minute. I got to think about your question a little bit here. Um, how can you possibly have an unknown destination MAC? Unless, unless I'm doing like an ARP request or something in the history of boot P and DHCP in those areas. I, I, I'm not sure where to... About four questions popped up in my head when I read when I heard that one. We can see if there's a follow up for that. Uh, let's move on to the next one. Also very similar. If the destination MAC is not on the same VLAN, what happens to the packet? Okay, first off, it works like this. Host A wants to communicate with host B. Host A will do what's called the adjacency test um, where it takes source IP, source mask, and does IP ending, and you have a result you and I call the network that host A resides on. So host A is going to take the, then take the destination IP address and do IP ending and have a result. Now, when those results are compared, if, if host A and host B have the same result, then host B is local and, host, and then host A will initiate an ARP request for host B. So it, it'd be saying, uh, I, I'm looking for 131.107.1.10, but the MAC address is 12 Fs and it's an ARP request. Now, if host B is remote, meaning it does not have the same network, then I'm gonna ask myself as host A, I'm gonna say, do I have a route? Do I have a route, a default gateway, a gateway of last resort? Uh, if not, hush up and sit down. Um, so the, the difference is on the adjacency test, whether I, I do an ARP request for the local host or for the gateway. Great, thank you, Kevin. Let's see, next question. Uh, why do we say MPLS works on layer 2.5 of the OSI model? <laughs> 
Well, that's because it actually slips a la label in between the layer two header and the layer three header. So in MPLS, we it's you know it's on the internet, therefore it's real, says Abe Lincoln. Quote. So you know it. They say 2.5 because the label is actually slipped in between the headers. Okay. Let's see. What is the difference between multi-layer switch and a regular switch? And when do you need to use a multi-layer switch instead of a router? Well, what's happening there is um, merchandising. Merchandising. For, for instance, today, if you tell me you have a switch, I don't really know what that means. Or if you say you have a router, I really don't know what that means like I did back in 1990. The definitions were solid and fixed. Uh, but now um, we assume, for the most part, when you say switch, we assume layer two. Again, let me put emphasis on that assumption because this is 2020. I mean, it's like moving from, from rubbing sticks to having a big lighter. So when you say switch, we assume layer two. When you say multi layer, what you're saying is, this is a switch that has the ability to make decisions at layer two, layer three, and your upper layers. It just has the potential for your upper layer decisions. When you purchase a layer three switch, which is also a multi-layer switch, all ports are set and functioning at OSI layer two. You actually have to go in there and tell it IP routing to turn on routing. You have to tell it no switch port to remove layer two so you can put an IP address on an interface. So what you're saying is potential to make a forwarding decision at layers greater than OSI layer two. Great, thank you, Kevin. Uh, let's see, this is really starting to become a, a question and answer with a Cisco expert, so I appreciate all the answers you're providing. Let's see, this question, uh, why is wireless LAN called 802.11? <laughs> Well, I was taught many, many years ago that 802 comes from February of 1980 when the group first came together. And I don't have anything to offer you about the dot 11. Um, I'm sure there is an answer and I'm sure I've read it many a times, but I just didn't retain it. That's just the IEEE group just came up with that notation. Thanks, Kevin. Let's see uh, another good one here. What is the difference between IGRP and EIGRP? IGRP is, is older, Cisco's older routing protocol. Um, I believe 16-bit, it's been so many years since I've played with that. Uh, EIGRP is the, the enhanced IGRP flavor of Cisco. It is proprietary to Cisco, meaning they own it. But in the last few years, uh, iOS 15, they've allowed other vendors to now participate with it. Um, but it's just another protocol out there. It is a distance vector. Uh, some books call it advanced distance vector, but it is, um, it's a distance vector routing protocol that inherently is how far and what direction, but it is enhanced with link state properties. Great, thank you, Kevin. Let's see this question. Can you please provide a brief explanation of how spanning tree protocol works? <laughs> okay, let's try a brief, a brief on that. Okay, so, um, it is a dialogue, an inter-switch link dialogue from layer two to layer two every two seconds. And it carries um, information in that dialogue. Now the dialogue is called a bridge protocol data unit or BPDU. And inside that we have math that as we receive it, we will yield if your math is superior to mine, uh, meaning lower, or I'm going to stay present if my math is superior to yours. But ultimately, spanning tree is a dialogue so that these layer two devices can agree agreeably that some ports are forwarding, some ports are blocking, but overall they're ensuring there's only one way to reach any one segment at a given time. Great, thank you. Uh, let's see what we have here. Why is ISIS considered a better link state protocol than OSPF? Uh, I can't argue that. I apologize. I, I don't, oh, I, I, I just have nothing to offer you, dude. That would be convincing. I apologize. Uh, Not a problem, I, Kevin. Yeah. We'll just move on. Let's see. Uh, here's an, an update to the previous question concerning the dest destination MAC addresses. Could you please explain what will be the destination MAC in the packet if it's not known? 
Is that the same? Uh, seems like we're dancing around the same subject there. It, it does. Um, here's a, here here's an additional correction. Maybe this would help. Could you explain? Please explain what would be the des destination MAC in the packet if the destination MAC is not known to the source device, but it knows the destination IP and it has default route to reach it. Okay, uh, all right, so what you're describing is an ARP request. An ARP request says, I know your layer three, I don't know your layer two. Now going back to the adjacency test, if, if I am host A wanting to talk to host B and host B is deemed local, meaning same network, then my ARP request will have 12 hexadecimal Fs in the source, I'm sorry, in the destination for host B. But now you, you went on further, you mentioned a router. All right, now, if the IP address is remote to host A and I have a default route, then my destination will still be all Fs for the IP address of my default route, unless I have previously resolved it in a prior ARP request. Thank you, Kevin. And that actually uh, concludes all of our questions. Uh, got a few uh, more details for the attendees, and then we can uh, move on to our day. But it First off, I want to thank you, Kevin. That was a great presentation. I hope everyone enjoyed today's webinar. If you'd like to learn more about this topic, we recommend the new CCNA Implementing and Administering Cisco Solutions course. And in this time of social distancing, I'd like to mention that all of our Cisco courses are offered in virtual or on-demand formats to enable you to continue to build your Cisco skills safely. And as attendee of today's webinar, we'd like to help you take the next step. Use the discount codes. Uh, listed here to receive 25% off your next global knowledge course. Use webinar 25 in the US and CA webinar 25 in Canada. And finally, please be sure to continue to visit the global knowledge website to access additional free resources like technical articles, white papers, and other webinars. Uh, thank you everybody, stay safe and have a great rest of your day.